Yes. Good evening, everyone. How is everyone feeling tonight? You feeling good? Yes. I know we're going to have some serious conversation, but we can still have a good time, right? Okay. Welcome to Winter Jazz Fest. Welcome to this panel. Thank you for being here. Tonight, we're having this panel. We're going to be exploring why the jazz world needs gender equity. We'll talk about the Next Jazz Legacy Program, a new national, a new national apprenticeship program, excuse me, for women and non-binary improvisers in jazz with the intersection of gender and race as its guiding principles. We're not only gonna talk about why we need gender equity, but how we can do it. Is that all right? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Just so you know, Next Jazz Legacy is a partnership between New Music USA and the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. With support from the Mellon Foundation, please visit newmusicusa.org for more information. All right, so we're gonna start first with Terry Lynn Carrington. Yes. A Grammy Award winning NEA Jazz Master, drummer, creator, founder of Berkeley Institute of Gender and Justice, and co-founder of the Next Jazz Legacy Program. Before we get into talking to you, Terry Lynn, we just have to say that Terry Lynn, when you think of what a mentor is, she is like the gold star of what mentorship looks like. She is one of these musicians, these like, of course, she's like big deal, but also like looks back for the ones that are coming up. So it's no surprise that she is needed in multiple places on tonight. So we're gonna talk a little bit and she's gonna run to her gig and then come back and finish the night, okay? So, Terry Lynn, why does the world need gender equity? Why does jazz world need gender equity? Uh, well, I think it's pretty simple when you think about uh, the music and uh, the people that innovated and, and developed it and, uh, and the musicians and even the non-musicians, you know, uh, uh, presenters, press, label executives, traditionally has always been male dominated. And we've, I think, just kind of accepted that, even the women that have come up. I know for me, my career, I've been, well, I got my union car when I was 10. So I've been professional for 47 years, which is a minute, you know. And, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, but my point here is that I always accepted it's just, you know, the way it is. It's male dominated and I needed to fit in. And I think, um, you know, I had a bit of an awakening probably around 10 years ago or so, uh, realizing that it's not, it's just not fair to have to fit in to this and that the actual community and culture needs to do more to, to change this. And, if you think about only really kind of like half the population has dominated the creation of the sound of the music. I'm wondering, I'm just, I'm talking, you know, I'm uh, teaching myself how to listen differently and wondering what it sounds like or what it will sound like when there's gender equity and, uh, you know, what other kinds of, uh, you know, what, what's, what other kinds of sonic uh, palettes will be discovered and, and, and um, you know, investigated. So that's, that's why, because the sound demands you know, that we evolve you know, or, or we'll be stuck in a different way. I mean, the music has constantly been evolving, of course, it's a continuum, but uh, it's going to evolve differently when there's gender equity. And I'm excited personally to see what that sound is like, and that's why uh, these types of programs with uh, younger artists, emerging artists, are so important because they need to be supported uh, in, a, in a similar way that I was uh, over the years. Because I got a lot of opportunities, I would say, before I was ready, you know. And uh, my father literally gave me access to the jazz stage, and uh, I realized that's not the case for everyone. So I think these types of programs are super important to help. That and I've seen. Um, I know you haven't asked me all this, but because I have to leave, yes, like, please. like five minutes. Yes, you saying everything. I was going to ask you anyway. <laughs> no, I just seen how it, uh, how it's already. You know how things are shifting. You know we've had more of a. Well, we've had both a racial and uh, gender reckoning, so to say, 
uh, in society over the last few years in, in this country. I mean, you know, I'm just, you know, obviously what we've gone through in 2020 and with Black Lives Matter, with Me Too. And uh, I, I feel a shift happening. And so uh, we have to be careful that that shift doesn't, uh, you know, the things don't kind of revert back to how they were. And what it takes is for everybody, you know, male musicians, women musicians, because, you know, women have been invested, invested in patriarchy as well and, and, being, uh, and being exceptions. So uh, it's everybody's work to do. So that's really an important part of how the music will evolve. And the last thing I'll say is I feel like if you care about the music, if you truly care about it, you have to look at this as a serious, serious thing, because you want the, the music to reach its full, most, you know, fullest potential. Thank you so much for your commitment to that. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think a lot of musicians in your position, it's easy to be like, all right, well, I'm fine. I'll help out just for play, for show. You've been about this mentorship program, but now it's beautiful that Next Jazz Legacy program gets to have you be a part of, of that mission. I think we're all curious as to how did this collaboration come to be? Because it's like a match made in heaven. Well, this woman here, Vanessa Reed, she uh, reached out to me uh, when she was moving here or maybe after she moved here and um, got the position at New Music USA. And we had a mutual friend in London, uh, John Cummings, and he told her to reach out to me. And so we talked about this, I don't know, about a year or a year and a half or something like that. And I just kept thinking about my own experiences and what are the things that uh, really helped, helped me the most and the things that I wasn't seeing enough of with um, you know young women artists and I, I came it came to me just that what I said a minute ago having uh, opportunities playing with people that were better than me playing with people that could kick my butt um, in these apprenticeship uh, type settings even before I was ready you know people that saw potential and so I, we talked about it a lot and developed this program and was fortunate enough to be funded by the Mellon Foundation. Thank you, Mellon Foundation. The money, your money is going to good use because I am familiar with a good number of the scholars in the Next Jazz Legacy program, but is there anything overarching you would like to share about the scholars in this year's, last year's, this year's program? What have you observed? Well, yeah, I think I've seen some, some growth, you know, over the year uh, in, uh, I mean, I think at, at your, in your formative years, you keep developing, you know, quickly actually. And, um, you know, we have two trombonists that happen to be on stage uh, right now, um, Kalia and Lexi. And we have two keyboardists, pianists in the program, Anastasia and Alexis. Um, and we have uh, uh, a drummer, Ivana Cuesta, you know, Gonzalez. Um, and we have two guitarists, Loke and uh, uh, Kiana. So uh, this is, you know, an interesting combination, cohort, because um, the instrumentation is kind of interesting. And they've, I've watched them work it out and work together because everybody's kind of coming a little bit from um, different areas, which is what we wanted. Yes. We wanted uh, different parts of jazz to be uh, represented stylistically. And we also wanted uh, people that were also in different phases or stages of uh, of their development, or you know, like you know, some people may you know have records out already, and some people may not. Um, some people may have had some strong experiences playing with well-known musicians, and some people may not. Some people might right out of college, and some people may have been out for a little bit. Um, so, you know, we had these different parameters that we were trying to address so it wasn't, uh, you know, the same type of person for I, all of I think it's beautiful that it's a diverse, um, it, everyone has access to that. It's a big thing about jazz is tokenism. It's always the same people who get the opportunities. So I think it's wonderful that it's curated and anyone can get a chance. Terry Lynn, it's time for you to go to your gig. 
So yes, thank, thank you, you thank so you for much, me on the clock. <laughs> all right, and I apologize for having to leave, but you're in good, good hands with all these amazing people. And, and thank you to Vanessa for being such a great partner and to New Music USA. Thank you, Terry Lynn. We can give her a hand. She'll be back later on to play, so stick around if you can. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. <laughs> um, I, you're so humble. You asked me not, intro, not to recite your whole resume, whatever, but I think what you're doing, uh, she's president of New Music USA and co-founder of Next Jazz Legacy Program. I think it's incredible and so important. I didn't know about this program until this year, and I was like, oh my gosh, there's something like this that exists. Like The jazz community needs that. So why is this important to you? So this is really important to me personally and to New Music USA because many of our programs as a national resource for music creators are really seeking to address the many inequities that we know still exist in our field. And one thing I'm particularly passionate about is collaborating with artists to ensure that we're building these programs with the right kind of knowledge and expertise and networks in place from the start. And we're not trying to parachute the ideas of funding organizations or service organizations onto our communities. So I've really valued the collaboration with Terry Lynn Carrington. And also, you know, we've got an incredible lineup of mentors, and you're going to hear from one in a moment, and band leaders who've been hosting apprenticeships. So Building these ideas with artists to bring about change is what we're all about at New Music USA. And I think with Next Jazz Legacy, what's important, and this applies to many of our programs, we're trying to focus on a particular moment in an individual artist's career, whether at a really pivotal time, and they could really benefit from multi-layered forms of support. So we didn't want to just give a grant, that's important, but we also wanted to make sure that the apprenticeship was central to this initiative, that they would also have a mentor, and we've also been making promotion films about each artist, and perhaps one of the most important things is the collaboration amongst the artists involved in the program, so hopefully you're all going to stay in touch after this ends, and you know that's a way that they can become a kind of network for good, a sort of force uh, for the future in continuing to lift up other women and other non-binary instrumentalists in the community. That's so beautiful. I think we can all clap to that. Um... <laughs> can you talk a little bit more in depth about the different like areas that? happen within the program. I love, I feel like I remember you mentioned in entrepreneurship, like financial support and education of some sort. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at supporting all of the participants with their creative development. So there are kind of music mentors as well as business mentors. Business. Yeah, yeah. Who are helping um, each of the um, artists in Next Jazz Legacy think about how they can best use their unrestricted funding to get their career to the next level. And this is similar to some of the other programs we run at New Music USA. For example, in film music, we know that there is an incredible uh, gender gap and, and lack of diversity in film scoring. So again, we're collaborating with leading composers in film music in Los Angeles to mentor and support the next generation of diverse composers working in film. So each time we're trying to look at how we can add value to the money we give with other skills, opportunities, and networks, and orientation, and just general support and recognition. We appreciate that because it's very easy for this topic to be the hot topic. Here's funding for just this year, but how, what does that look like next year when I'm actually trying to do my project or survive as a jazz musician? No one wants to be a jazz music, broke jazz musician anymore. We're tired of that stereotype. So thank you for that. So next we're gonna move on to Mary. Hi Mary, how you feeling? I'm good. Yes. Mary Halverson is a guitarist, composer, and MacArthur Fellow, um, and one of New York City's most in-demand guitarists, collaborators, band leaders, and a band leader and apprenticeship host within the Next Jazz Legacy program. Uh, Mary, what I'm curious about is who were some mentors that looked out for you that kind of helped you push through as you were developing? Um, so, 
it was interesting what Terry Lynn was saying about the landscape really changing and there being sort of a shift in momentum over the past few decades. Um, so I'm 42 now. So when oh, I was good. starting out, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, when I was starting out, I, I really didn't, I had very few female mentors, and especially as a guitarist, I, I pretty much never even met another female guitarist, um, which is also, it's really exciting to see that there's two guitarists in this cohort um, in the program. But, you know, I was, I was very lucky, I consider myself very lucky because I had really incredible male role models and people that mentored me, and, and I was in a very positive situation in that respect, but it was something that I, I always felt was lacking. Um, I, you know, I had a couple females who were important to me. One was Jane Ira Bloom, the saxophonist, who uh, was my teacher. Yeah, she's the best. Um, and another saxophonist, actually, uh, Diane Warnick, who I, I played saxophone for a brief while in high school, and I studied with her. And so it was, even having that little bit, uh, working a little bit, um, with female mentors was something I felt I missed out on and was deeply important um, just to, you know, to have that support and again, not to feel like you're just trying to, trying to fit in. And, you know, I, I was so used to being the only girl in the band all the time. That being said, over the past couple decades, I'm really feeling this shift. I mean, I, I work with so many women now you know, it's not 50%, but I work with so many women and I, I play in a lot of bands that are all women or more than half women. So it's been really nice to see that momentum shift. And I think what's important about this program is continuing it and continuing it with the next generations and also fostering relationships between people, uh, musicians of different ages too. That's something that's always been important to me. I work with a lot of musicians that are older than me, that are younger than me. So you know, checking out. I'm, I'm working with Kalia, you know, in this program, and she's somebody I was already aware of. I'd been wanting to connect with anyway, so when this opportunity came up, it was like, great. Um, and, you know, it's really like a, it's not just I'm teaching Kalia or whatever. It's like I'm learning from her, too, and I'm checking out what she's doing, and that's really inspiring to me. Um, so it's been really exciting, and I think, you know, the more female musicians that are out there doing it, the more it inspires younger people to get started. So that's, that's kind of what I'm about and that's why I'm interested in this program. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I would like to introduce you guys to Kalia, um, who was a trombonist, as Mary mentioned, creator um, and Next Jazz Legacy awardee. Kalia worked with Jen Shu as well as apprenticing with Mary this past year, as you know. She also performed on SNL <clears throat> with Japanese Breakfast and released her album Regrowth on New Amsterdam Records. So what's up, Kalia? Hi, how's it going, Melanie? <laughs> And then I'm just gonna introduce Lexi and then we're all gonna talk. Lexi Hammer, who is also a trombonist as well as a vocalist. Um, Lexi worked with Tia Fuller and Bobby McFerrin through the Next Jazz Legacy program, which is super dope. And is also teaching black American music to fourth and fifth graders in Cincinnati, Ohio, while striving to create work that encourages herself and others to explore areas of unabated innovation. So not only are you being mentored, but you're mentoring other people. That's so dope. Um, how has this program been to you two ladies? How has it been working with Mary and the rest of? It's been, it's mentors? been, <laughs> sorry. It's been great. Um, I don't know. You, you asked Mary if she had had female mentors when she was coming up in the music and I hadn't had female mentors until this past year. And I hadn't really had a mentor at all up until the last year. Um, I've had impactful teachers over the years, um, but learning jazz music within institutions can be really difficult, especially when it's only men teaching. Um, and I feel like some of my teachers weren't looking out for me in that way. Um, and perhaps they never taught a woman or non-binary folk in music before, so you know, maybe they didn't have the tools to support me when I was coming up, but I was asked this question maybe a couple of years ago, uh, who are some of my mentors in music, and I didn't really have a response for them. Um, there are people who have inspired me over the years and people that I listen to, and some, you know, some folks who I've taken a few lessons from who um, influence the way that I write or improvise, but 
nothing consi consistent like how it's been with Mary or Jen, for example. Um, and now it's so nice when people ask me that question because I can I consider both Mary and Jen to be like really huge mentors for me. Um, so I'm really thankful for for that and for the next jazz legacy for for that. But um, aside from that, like the performance opportunities, the funding opportunities. I mean, it's not all about the funding for sure, but I have been able to fund some projects and a tour with the money that we were granted, which is incredible, you know. Um, and this is the first grant that I've received, so, and it's I, it's one that I will never forget. That's beautiful, and we hope that you get all the grants and you get all the money. We want all, a lot of abundance for all jazz musicians. <laughs> yeah. Lexi, I think it's really awesome that you are being mentored, but you also have the capacity to give back to the youth, teaching them black American music. Where, how do you make the time? How do you split yourself in three to do all of that? Yes, so um, I love being able to teach the younger kids about jazz and not just jazz, but also gospel and blues. I love it because me, uh, when I was growing up, I loved to explore with music. I didn't only just want to be in the church and just listen to gospel music and just sing gospel music. Like when I heard another song that I wasn't used to, I was like, ooh, what is that? Let me get into it. So I like to explore myself. Like that's natural to me. So I love to give that back to kids that are in Cincinnati, you know. I love to give them uh, what was given to me, basically. My mom, you know, she would have the Clark sisters planned and she'll have uh, Fred Hammond planned. Then I found like take six in the tape box. So I was like, uh-oh. Okay, so that gave me a lot of joy, finding all this different music around me, especially going to perform in art school and, you know, being able to play classical music first before jazz, you know, and then going into choir. All of that really made me the person that I am today. So I love to give back to kids and say, okay, so here's jazz. Here, these artists get into it, let's look at it, and then also be able to give them something in gospel, give them something in blues, give them something in funk, because you know, it's, it's all good to me, I love it. I love that, I am obsessed with the fact that you found a way to not only be present as an improviser in black American jazz music, but also maintain your gospel roots. I'm curious, how has that marriage worked with the Next Jazz Legacy program, because a lot of times, you know, people who are jazz musicians who also come from R&B, gospel, soul, it's like, but we don't do that in this program. This is just jazz. <laughs> is that different with Next Jazz Legacy program? Um, for me, I've had a great experience uh, being not only just a jazz artist, but like gospel as well. I've had a great experience in this program because I've been given the opportunity to be exactly who I am on the stage. Yes. You know what I mean? Playing trombone, okay, and then, uh, especially last time I just played with Miss Tia this summer, and uh, playing with her, I not only played trombone, but she also gave me the space to play tambourine. You know, it's kind of interesting. So I get to bring in my home, you know, onto the stage now and to the future. So I've had a great experience marrying the two genres, you know, because that's who I am, so yeah. So beautiful. I think we always talk about why, like I mentioned before, why we need gender equity, but I would like anyone who is inspired to answer how, what are some things that we can do so that things can get better when it comes to gender equity, race equity, even ageism, whoo, that's another thing. What can we do on a day-to-day -day basis to change that? So the first thing I would say is, I think we just need to celebrate all of the amazing initiatives that we're now seeing, even just in New York, um, that are deliberately focusing on those who've been left out in the past. And so, you know, I like the idea of Next Jazz Legacy being in a family of programs alongside Jen Shu's M3 Mutual Mentorship for Musicians, which we've also supported which is more focusing on some of the challenges for mid-career artists. And then, you know, that complements what we're doing with Next Jazz Legacy. So I think the more, the better. Um, and the thing I'm really passionate about is slightly rejecting this idea that it's all about education. It's all about the next generation. I don't believe in that because I think if we only invest in education and the next generation and don't think about championing the people who are already there, then these younger people are kind of looking into a void and will never have the role models that they need to kind of feel that inspiration and believe that they can get there. So that's why in a previous role, I also set up Key Change, which is the global pledge that over 500 festivals have now signed up to. And they're all committed to having gender balance on their stages by 
well, actually, by the end of last year, that was the pledge. So, and Winter Jazz Fest is part of that initiative. And I think the next generation needs to be able to see themselves on stage. And we should stop kidding ourselves that there aren't any women or non-binary musicians out there that we can already book and that we can already program. They are there. We just have been kind of ignoring them. And there have been obstacles and prejudices that have meant they haven't had as many opportunities as their male counterparts. And for the scholars, I'm curious if you could just dream of a perfect world of like what things would be in place for you to thrive as women in jazz, what kinds of things? Some, for example, I always think, wow, we need an artist-led union, you know? What are some things that, you, if you can imagine, that we could have to make things better? For me, it's more so the culture in rehearsals or on gigs is not only, and this happens now, and I feel like our generation is really good at this, but looking out for each other and not only, only having to look out for myself, and that's something that I wish to continue. It's not so much, I mean, I hope for that in my future, but I hope for that currently, too, to not feel like I always have to speak up for myself if something happens, you know? And so just ultimately, I would love the support from everyone, you know, regardless of the gender of the people I'm working with. Um, yeah. yeah. It sounds like you're talking about allyship, which is another thing that I think is really beautiful about Next Jazz Legacy is that you also incorporate male mentorship and support as well. So like a male ally is really important in this journey. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Anyone wanna mention anything? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's important for everybody to be on board, mm -hmm. like you said, and, and I think the thing about it is it, you know, you can't be lazy. It takes a little bit of work. And, you know, I think, like, the the real book that we're all playing music from tonight um, is a great example. There's 101 female composers that wrote music for this book. I don't know all of them, you know. And it's I think people have to do the work to see who's out there um, to, to check a lot of people out. And I think um, that's going to make a difference. It's not just women, but everybody actively checking it out. Who's out there? Who's Who's playing this music? Um, who are these people? Awareness. Awareness is so important. Yes. And, yeah, Terry Lynn and I were both very passionate about involving men and women in the program because it's simple. Gender equity benefits everyone. Yeah. The music will be stronger. The music will be more relevant to more people if we're drawing from a more diverse talent pool. So you can even see it as a kind of selfish reason to be involved. You know, the whole community will be stronger. I'm curious, before we open it up to our Q&A, is there any cool projects any of you human beings are working on that you want to share? Any gigs in New York City happening where we can come hear you play in the next few weeks? Where can we find you? What's happening? Um, so I'm looking to release my first ever project this year. Um, it's going to be a small little EP. going to show the world what I can do and especially um, get the folks at home, like they've been like, when is your CD coming out? I've been hearing that for the last five to ten years. So it's like, all right, just give me a minute. It's going to be here. So I'm looking forward to releasing a project. Wonderful. Make sure you guys follow that. Well, I get to go on tour with Mary in April, which I'm really excited about. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be really fun. Um, and then I'm playing a couple of other sets as a part of Winter Jazz Fest, if you all want to come check me out. I'm playing with Joel Ross uh, tomorrow night at LPR, and then Saturday I'm playing with Alfredo Colon. Um, I'm not sure of the exact venue, but it's a part of the Brooklyn Marathon uh, at 1045. Yeah. Awesome. And you, Mary, you got anything you want to let the people know? Uh, well, the tour with Kalia in April. Um, for those of us who are based here in New York, we're going to be at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn. Um, I don't remember the exact date, but it's sometime in early April. Um, and I have another gig tomorrow night at Winter Jazz Fest with the pianist Sylvie Corvassier, and that's at the Jazz Gallery. Beautiful. And I, and I don't have any gigs, obviously. You don't have any gigs, Vanessa? <laughs> but, but the great, exciting news is that just a couple of days ago, with another brilliant panel of jazz artists, we selected the next cohort of uh, Next Jazz Legacy artists for next year. So watch this space for that announcement. There are seven more brilliant 
uh, women and non-binary artists who are going to be announced in the next few weeks. That's very exciting. When is the window where people can apply for the next one then, so people can start getting ready now? Uh, this fall, I this think. Fall. That's when Great. we'll be looking at that. Okay, that's exciting. Um, I, we're gonna open up real quick, is that all right? If we have, we can ask some people. I'm curious if anyone in the room has any ideas of how we can really, for, outside of programs like Next Jazz Legacy program, what can we do to forge equity in the jazz world? What are some tools? What, if we could imagine a world like that, what would it look like? Anyone? Ooh, everybody quiet. No one? Anyone have any questions about Next Jazz Legacy program? No. So Melanie, how about you? Do you have a question? Yes. I think that's beautiful. I guess this forum right now, we're just like brainstorming what are things that we could see. I agree. I think it would be really great to have more conversations on a consistent level within the jazz community at large about what are things that we need and we would like to see to improve for sure. Yeah, I mean, several of New Music USA's programs are all about building community as much as giving money. So again, it's creating the opportunity for artists to come together in a kind of structured way and to create that space and time that wouldn't have been there without the program. So I agree that it's really important. And I, I think there's some press here. I think another thing is that we want to make sure that this, the information about this wonderful program that everyone is sharing the news, um, just so you know, to remind you guys again, let me get my notes straight. Next Jazz Legacy is a partnership between New Music USA and the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice with generous support from the Mellon Foundation. If you wanna know more, go to www.newmusicusa.org for more information. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. How's everyone have anything else they wanna mention before we have some great music for the rest of the evening? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Thank you, we love that. It's true, this, this industry, yes, we have another question? Yes. Is that a part of Next Child's Legacy program? It's not a part saying? of this program, but I totally agree. I think it's a great idea, and that's why I was mentioning there are lots of different initiatives that are trying to tackle all of these different challenges and opportunities, and I think that's a really important idea. There are programs like Harlem School of the Arts in Harlem. Um, Saint, uh, there's the Brooklyn School of Music, Brooklyn Academy of Music. There are small little pockets of music education, jazz education, but I think the real issue is how can how is this resource available to everyone? So since we're all brainstorming tonight, that's something that maybe we can explore some more is how can everyone get access to this, not just the rich kids or the kids whose grandparents are jazz legends or something, you know what I mean? 
Um, and one thing, yes, I, there also there's a program called Face the Music, um, which I think is from the Kaufman Music Center, but it's also a program, and, and I think it um, does involve high school age kids, and it's really cool. All right, well, in this, yes, 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 please. Let's talk afterwards. That sounds great. And New Music USA does support quite a bit of collaboration between choreographers and, and music creators. And the whole point of Next Jazz Legacy is trying to introduce artists taking part to new opportunities. So, yeah, let's talk. That's right, he does. Thank you everyone for being here to be part of this conversation, watching the music, buying the music is very important, but also having these crunchy conversations are really important to move this music forward. Thank you Next Jazz Legacy Program for what is happening, this is really excited. Now, we've done all the talking, now we get to hear some music. So we're gonna change things up on stage and then we're gonna bring up the first band, which I'll be back to introduce them. In the meantime, eat, get some more drinks, and enjoy yourselves.